A great Scottish poet was born on this day, September 11th, in the year 1700. He was one of the great uh, 18th century nature poets. His name was James Thompson, and everyone knew James Thompson's famous poem, The Seasons, in the 18th century. In fact, Wordsworth considered it the, the only nature poem that really mattered in the 18th century. But today, he's not much read or studied, but he's got some great poetry, and I thought I'd introduce you to The Seasons. The first one that was published was Winter, and this poem underwent a number of significant changes. I have the version from 1726. This was the first version um, that was published on its own, and then he would make subsequent revisions, and eventually a revised version of this was published in The Seasons. Let me show you just how this opens, and I have this uh, edition online, linked in the description below. See winter comes to rule the varied year, sullen and sad, with all his rising train, vapors and clouds and storms. Be these my theme, these that exalt the soul to solemn thought and heavenly musing. Traditional openings declaring the great theme of the poem Winter. Here personified, the seasons are often personified, a uh, favorite trick of the 18th century poets. Welcome kindred glooms, wished wintry horrors, hail. And he's echoing Milton here. You've noticed that this is in blank verse, it's in Miltonic blank verse. We've got iambic pentameter, lines composed of uh, 10 syllables, five of them stressed within the pattern of unstressed stressed, which is the mode in which Milton wrote. It's strange for a poet in the 18th century not to be writing heroic couplets, especially in the early 18th century. But here we have it, and he's echoing the line from Satan, Hail Horrors. He's welcoming winter as uh, bringing with it occasions for solemn thought, Wish wintry horrors hail, with frequent foot pleased have I in my cheerful morn of life, when nursed by careless solitude I lived, and sung of nature with unceasing joy. Pleased have I wandered through your rough domains, trod the pure virgin snows, myself as pure, heard the winds roar, and the big torrent burst, are seen the deep fermenting tempest brood in the red evening sky. Thus passed the time, till through the opening chambers of the south looked out the joyous spring, looked out and smiled. So begins the great blank verse poem, Winter. Now, Samuel Johnson, the great 18th century critic, in his Lives of the English Poets, published in 1799, so quite a bit after this, uh, wrote about James Thompson. And he says, as a writer, he is entitled to one praise of the highest kind. His mode of thinking and of expressing his thoughts is original. His blank verse is no more the blank verse of Milton or of any other poet than the rhymes of Pryor are the rhymes of Cowie. His numbers, his pauses, his diction, are of his own growth without transcription, without imitation. He thinks in a peculiar train, and he thinks always as a man of genius. He looks round on nature and on life with the eye which nature bestows only on a poet, the eye that distinguishes in everything presented to its view whatever there is on which imagination can delight to be detained and with a mind that at once comprehends the vast and attends to the minute. The reader of the seasons wonders that he never saw before what Thompson shows him, and that he never yet has felt what Thompson impresses. Now, that's a, that's a great criterion of poetic greatness, I think. Having the ability to impress upon us and make us see things in a new way, and make us think that, and make us wonder why we didn't, see things that way before. He's almost got, and I think Johnson is suggesting this in his own way, the eye of a naturalist. 
and Gilbert White in his um, The Natural History of Selborne, another excellent 18th century prose work, will quote Thompson sometimes. He'll, he'll, he'll quote Thompson's poem and say, the way that Thompson has observed the cows feeding or grazing is perfectly true to life. It's very realistic, and we see realistic depictions here in, in winter as well. Let's see. Let me read you another passage of that kind. Beautiful example of his descriptive powers here. Now when the western sun withdraws the day and humid evening, gliding o'er the sky in her chill progress, checks the straggling beams and robs them of their gathered vapory prey, where marshes stagnate and where rivers wind, cluster the rolling fogs and swim along the dusky mantled lawn. And in picking up hints, allusions from Milton here, here at this point, Lycidas, but it's not perfectly the Miltonic mode, as Johnson says, but he's very much within the same meditative tradition as Milton. Okay, so here we are, the dusky mantled lawn, then slow descend, once more to mingle with their watery friends. The vivid stars shine out in radiant files, and boundless ether glows, till the fair moon shows her broad visage in the crimsoned east. Now, stooping, seems to kiss the passing cloud, now o'er the pure cerulean rides sublime. Cerulean was the blue deep of the sky. This is the ascending of the moon. Wide the pale deluge floats with silver waves o'er the skied mountain or to the low-laid vale. From the white rocks in dim reflection gleams and faintly glitters through the waving shades. I mean, James Thompson is so rooted in English literature. Um, he didn't fit it in Edinburgh, where English literature was kind of a cult at that time, but he's so rooted in the English meditative tradition. You have these almost Spenserian epithets, skied mountain, the low-laid vale, and these uh, Miltonic descriptions and just the extension of the blank verse, how it just carelessly unravels in description of the evening and the coming on of night. Just a beautiful passage. Now, Johnson uh, tempers his praise with some criticism. He says that the great defect of the seasons is want of method. But for this I know not that there was any remedy. Of many appearances subsisting all at once, no rule can be given why one should be mentioned before another. Yet the memory wants the help of order, and the curiosity is not excited by suspense or expectation. So though the poetry is beautiful, Johnson is, is saying that um, it doesn't really excite expectation or suspense. Milton is a great poet of suspense. Johnson's saying that James Thompson's not like this. And there's no real reason why one line should precede the other. Uh, in, a, in a course on Romanticism once, I had a professor who read the poem, read the lines in a different order, and we really couldn't tell that he was doing that. I mean, you might pick the last few lines, read these backwards, and faintly glitters through the waving shades from the white rocks with dim reflection gleams, or the sky mountain, or the low-laid vale, wide the pale deluge floats with silver waves. Just the, syn <laughs> the syntax already is so, almost a hysterical sprawl in its just effusion, in its description, that you kind of lose the sense. And really, the effect is almost casting the spell of a reverie on one. And that might actually be part of the charm and part of the success of this poem, despite um, this, this defect, as Johnson calls it. Now, let me show you an exalted passage here. A great apostrophe to nature in this passage here. Nature, great parent, whose directing hand rolls round the seasons of the changeful year, how mighty! How majestic are thy works! With what a pleasing dread they swell the soul that sees, astonished, 
and astonished sings. You too, ye winds, that now begin to blow with boisterous sweep, I raise my voice to you. Where are your stores, ye viewless beings, say? Where your aerial magazines reserved against the day of tempest perilous? In what untraveled country of the air, hushed in still silence, sleep you when tis calm? Here, pretty much typical of nature in the 18th century as basically synonymous with the idea of providence or of God's working in the world. So you can see how this tradition was important for the Romantics. You know, the Romantics weren't the progenitors of this whole nature um, praise, this, this great religion of nature. It really began in the 18th century and it was out of a tradition which saw nature as basically synonymous with providence, as Coleridge would say. Actually, Coleridge himself, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, loved this poem. In 1798, he and, he and William Hazlitt, another romantic a critic, um, were at a village inn in the West Country, and in the breakfast nook there was a worn-out copy of James Thompson's The Seasons. And Coleridge pointed to it, addressing Hazlitt, and said, there is true fame. But James Thompson's poetry was actually very important to the Romantics. So it's really interesting, uh, this entire poem, you should see if you can find a, a complete edition of Thompson's Seasons. It really is good poetry to read, especially in the evening or in idle hours. There's something nice about the luxurious extravagance, the verbal extravagance of, of his poetry, of his blank verse. Again, totally different from Milton, as Johnson says, and very different from any poet that was before or after, especially in blank verse. Uh, but it's beautiful, beautiful poetry. And of course, he was an important poet, one that all 19th century readers and 18th century readers really would have been familiar with. So thanks for joining me and until next time.